Before we begin, let's have a short class on the rules of grammar. In particular, we'd be looking at the difference between a proper noun and a common noun. The reason this is necessary is due to the fact that in the Constitution for the United States of America, there are two classes of citizens that can only be distinguished by having a proper understanding of grammar. The word citizen appears in the Constitution 22 times, with 13 of those times appearing with the capital C. Strangely enough, the 14th time it appears is in the 14th Amendment and with a small c and every time after that. This is the difference between a proper noun and a common noun. Grammar is used as a form of communication in legal writings. If you do not have a proper understanding of grammar, you will lose the meaning of the information conveyed and have no one but yourself to blame. The difference between a common and proper noun is that proper nouns name specific people, places, or things, while common nouns refer to general types of people, places, or things. Proper nouns. Always capitalize. Proper nouns name specific people, places, or things. For example, Chicago and Mount Kilimanjaro are proper nouns. Common nouns. Usually only capitalized at the beginning of a sentence. Common nouns refer to general types of people, places, or things. For example, a city and a mountain are common nouns. Common nouns can also refer to qualities, ideas, or actions. For example, writer and continent are common nouns. Common nouns are often used with articles and other determiners. The difference between a common and proper noun is that proper nouns name specific people, places, or things while common nouns refer to general types of people, places, or things. Now, go read the Constitution and ask yourself why the framers of this document made this distinction when referring to the word citizen. Citizens and Citizens by Alfred Addisk As sovereigns who are citizens of the Republic, as guaranteed by Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution for the United States of America, we created the federal government as our political agent and public servant. As our creation, the federal government works for us and beneath us. Its immediate political subdivisions include the three branches of the federal government, like Congress, as well as the several quasi-sovereign federal states of the Union, like Texas or Delaware. However, the federal government also indirectly includes the corporate states, such as the state of Texas, which appear to be political subdivisions of Congress. Just because Congress is a political subdivision of our federal government does not prevent Congress from creating its own political subdivisions and agencies, such as the corporate states and national governments, wheels within wheels. On the face of it, there's nothing unconstitutional in this arrangement. However, this national within federal system includes an incredible deception and a secret betrayal of the American people. We have been collectively tricked, deceived, lured, and seduced into surrendering our birthrights as citizens, created by and subject only to God, in return for the lowly status of citizen with a small c, who are created by and subject to Congress, the national government, and the corporate bureaucracies. Through this deception, the federal government's creators, the people, have become the national government's creations, 14th Amendment citizens. The sovereigns have become the subjects, the servants have become the masters, and the natural order of the Declaration of July 4th, 1776 has been reversed. You can't get there from here. The question is whether the reversal that changed sovereigns into servants can be re-reversed. That is, is it possible for those who have been deceived into accepting the status of citizens to recover their birthright and regain their natural status as Citizens with a capital C. Absolutely. The only question is whether that return can be achieved peacefully through law or violently through a shooting revolution. The answer depends on both the national government and the citizens. If the citizens remain too lazy to study and learn to recognize their own predicament, there's little chance for a peaceful restoration of citizenship through law and politics. Likewise, no peaceful solution is possible if the national government is too stubborn to emancipate its citizens. Thus, if the people stay ignorant or the government refuses to surrender its power, the situation will continue as is until someone starts shooting. 
However, there's no sense in starting a shooting revolution to free a mob of incompetents who lack the intelligence, morality, or education necessary to be free. To suddenly free a mob like that, which currently populates the U.S., will only precipitate the formation of a government like that which replaced the Tsar after the Russian Revolution. Decentralized Powers I speculated previously in this issue that government centralized power is inversely proportional to the public's decentralized power. If so, the decentralized internet that empowers the people must also disempower centralized government. If government power is declining, the national government may be increasingly unable to stop citizens from regaining their status as citizens. This is good news, since you can't very well have a shooting revolution if one side is too weak to shoot. If government is growing too weak to resist a return to citizenship, the chances for a peaceful restoration are increased. More importantly, the Internet is an educational medium through which all Americans can learn to distinguish between citizens and citizens. We are learning to more accurately perceive and explain the differences between the two classes of citizenship. As we do, the citizens with a small c will be increasingly empowered to intelligently and intentionally choose which status they wish to embrace, that of the free and fully responsible citizen with a capital C or that of the limited liability citizen subject with a small c. The most important consequence of this education is to elevate the people's educational status from that of an ignorant mob only fit for citizenship with a small c to that of individuals both capable and worthy of being free citizens and powered with unalienable rights. The Dignity of Choice The choice between free citizens with a capital C and citizens subject with a small c is not automatic. Given the opportunity to choose, many Americans, perhaps most, would choose to remain as 14th Amendment citizen subjects. Freedom is not an easy state of affairs. Most people are too old, too young, too weak, ignorant, addicted, or incompetent to function as free, moral men. Such people may rationally choose to remain as government's protected citizen subjects. This kind of choice is biblical precedent where emancipated slaves or servants are afforded the opportunity to voluntarily resubmit themselves to their masters. They are lawfully entitled to recognize that they are better off as slaves and therefore free to reject freedom. But some Americans, perhaps many, will have the spiritual strength, personal pride, or even arrogance needed to choose to reclaim their heritage of unalienable rights and accept the full responsibilities of freedom. Unpleasant Truths Patriot dogma has declared for decades that we all live in an either-or world where only one form of government, federal or national, and one form of citizenship, capital C citizen or small c citizen, can survive. But just as government has deceived us into accepting the status of 14th Amendment citizens, the patriots, whether they know it or not, are deceiving themselves into believing that we must instead accept only the status of sovereign citizen. These mutually exclusive positions of both government and patriots are equally invalid. I believe there is room in America for both the federal and national governments and both citizens and citizens. One truth is unpleasant but undeniable. Most Americans are amoral. See the amoral majority, anti-shyster, volume number nine, number three, or otherwise unfit to be free. For patriots to demand the full rights and responsibilities of citizenship for such people is the equivalent that all children left at home alone must be given matches. A second truth is infuriating and also undeniable. Some Americans are not only morally fit to be free, they are almost incapable of enduring a world which denies them the freedoms and responsibilities that were granted by God, declared in our 1776 Declaration and protected by the Federal Constitution. For them, 14th Amendment citizenship is an unholy and tolerable curse. To force or deceive such good moral people into accepting the subject status of citizen is not only a political offense, but also a spiritual tragedy that denies them the right to worship their God as free men. A civilized alternative. Why not establish a political system that openly allows both classes of citizenship? Those who choose to be citizens and enjoy the benefits and duties, like paying income tax, of a legislative democracy under a national government may do so. Alternatively, others may choose to live as free and fully responsible citizens under God in a federal republic that only protects them against abuse by government. 
Such people would not receive government benefits like unemployment, social security, and limited liability from lawsuits. On the other hand, they wouldn't have to pay income tax or insure their automobiles. I don't pretend a dual system would be easily implemented, but why not openly allow both systems? The only impediments are the government's historic deceptions and our own ignorance. Once they admit their deceit and we face up to our ignorance, there's no reason to fight for either government citizenship or patriot citizenship. Likewise, there's no reason to terminate the federal or national government we need and could have both. Just because most Americans are currently unfit for the responsibilities of freedom does not justify compelling all Americans to accept the status of citizen subjects. If America is to truly remain the land of the free, there must be some publicly recognized procedure that allows at least some of us to live as citizens with a capital C. In the end, a recognition of both kinds of citizenship may not cause much outward change in America, but it will cause great inward change since the government will be operating without deception and the Americans will be afforded the dignity of personal choice that can only make all American citizens and citizens alike proud of themselves and envied by the world.